Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Brian Gifford. I'm the research director with the Integrative Benefits Institute. Um, I appreciate you joining the second of our pre-forum webinars. Um, today, we're going to hear about incentivized preventive care uh, from the Friedkin Group's experience. Um, joining us today are Ted Barrell, Director of Compensation and Benefits from the Friedkin Group, and Serene Jazzy, who is uh, the Director of Client Engagement and Analytics with the DHS Group. Um, they're going to be telling us a little bit about Friedkin Group. Um, before they do, um, let me say a little bit about the Integrated Benefits Institute. Um, we are a nonprofit organization focused on uh, workforce health and productivity. Um, we all know that illness has costs. We always try to find ways to, to show employers and their partners how health creates value. We do that by providing unbiased research and insights so employers and providers can make decisions that positively impact uh, the success of people, um, impact their productivity, and, and improve the overall performance of organizations. Um, we do that in a number of ways. We do that by providing our own benchmark statistics of health and productivity outcomes. We do that by research. And one of the most important ways we do that is by allowing employers to learn from one another. We do that through educational outreach such as this and through our annual forum, which will be held at the Weston St. Francis in San Francisco this year um, from March 12th through March 14th. If you are able and inclined, please join us there. I'm now going to turn it over to Shireen Jazzy of the DHS group. Um, she's going to tell us a little bit about their program, their programs. Shireen? Yes, thank you, Ryan. I'm just going to wait for this slide to respond here in a second. Okay. So hi, everyone. I'm Serene Jazzy, uh, as mentioned, as uh, Brian mentioned. Uh, my main role here at DHS is to work with our clients in using their health and wellness data to make strategic business decisions that help improve the health of their population and their bottom lines. Um, my background is in public health and management of information systems with a heavy focus on health analytics. Um, DHS was founded in 1997. We work with both employer groups and health plans in offering solutions and services towards a common goal, really, of improving population health. So uh, on the employer side, um, just a little bit more about what we do, uh, DHS offers software and that covers everything from benefit strategy to benefit administration, health analytics, and employee well-being. Uh, whereas on the health plan side, our software and services help uh, manage quality of care, improve HEDA scores, conduct Medicare audits, and, and a lot more. Um, so today, uh, I have the pleasure of presenting this webinar with Ted Barrell, who is uh, Director of Compensation and Benefits at Friedkin Group here in Houston. Uh, so welcome, Ted, and I'll let you present yourself and Friedkin. Thank you very much, Serene. Uh, I want to thank uh, both DHS and uh, IBI for the opportunity to work together on this project and present today. A little bit about the Friedkin Group. We are a family-owned, privately held company based in Houston, Texas, and own a number of automotive industry-related companies, the largest of which is Gulf States Toyota, which is an independent and exclusive distributor for Toyota vehicles in the Gulf States region. We also own a trucking company called U.S. Auto Logistics that is a car transportation company with over 500 truck drivers. We have a number of Lexus dealerships that we own in Texas, Pennsylvania, Ohio, and Nevada. And we have two smaller companies, uh, one of which uh, sells uh, um, auto warranty products and the other sells marketing products uh, through dealerships. Uh, when you look at our list of companies, uh, we all are all in a similar industry, but one thing that we find, especially on the topic today, is each of these companies has very distinct populations within it, whether it be a truck driving group, uh, individuals working in light assembly at our vehicle processing center, or a white collar population, all of which have uh, different opportunities and challenges. Thanks, Ted. Um, so 
Uh, here's a quick agenda of what we'll be covering today. Um, so first, we're going to be talking about the Friedkin Group's focus on preventive care, um, the role of data analytics, um, and then we'll take a look at a comparative analysis by participation uh, in the preventive care program that Friedkin has in place. Um, we'll wrap it up with a summary and some uh, and a Q&A segment at the end. So the purpose of our presentation today is to show you, the audience, the results of a pretty in-depth, uh, integrated data analytics study of the effectiveness and outcome of a wellness program that we have in place. And we'll talk a little bit more about it, but essentially this wellness program provides an incentive to participation to participants in our health plan to get their annual preventive care visits. And we put this program in place back in 2013 with an understanding that if our associates, our participants in the health plan get the appropriate preventive care that they need. Uh, that is going to help uncover uh, illnesses before they become serious and expensive to treat down the road. And hopefully we'll get some insights based on this analytics. Uh, the uh, information that we're looking at is data that's been integrated into the DHS data warehouse and analytical tool. It comes from a number of sources our uh, data from our HRIS system, medical and prescription drug claims, as well as separate data that we maintain on the participation in our wellness discount. We're going to see some insight into year-over-year uh, -year trends and health status and uh, give us a good um, view on what the current status of the health of the population is. And we think what we're getting out of this study as well is uh, some insight into opportunities to make some improvements and changes as we go along. The Friedkin Company, as I said, is a family-owned company, and we've been uh, in business, in, in this type of business, since about 1969 or 1970, and we have a long-standing tradition in uh, supporting the health and well-being of our associates that goes back many years and certainly many more years uh, earlier than we started even thinking about something called a wellness program. Uh, this shows up in one of our, in fact, the first of our our uh, corporate values, uh, which is our associate, is our most important asset. This is great to have on the top of the list when we go into the C-suite and talk about wellness programs because everybody really is operating from a common platform. Some of the aspects of our uh, health and wellness culture go to simple things like participating in charity walks, runs, and bicycle rides. We have uh, on-site fitness facilities, gyms in almost all of our major locations. In our corporate facility, we have subsidized healthy menu options in our cafe. Uh, and we just have a lot of fun little wellness things we like to do, weight loss contests, special events in our corporate fitness facilities to draw people in who don't necessarily use it on a day-to-day -day basis. So uh, we, we really try to incorporate it in, in many aspects of our associates' lives. Uh, one of the things that we've done recently is uh, we've put in place a wellness coach at our trucking company uh, who works one-on-one -on -one with our truck drivers and other associates in that company to help change behaviors and improve health. And we've put a nurse on site at our corporate facility to provide similar type of wellness coaching and navigation in the health system. We've earned a number of accolades uh, for our efforts, thankfully. Uh, that has come from, uh, among others, the American Heart Association, Houston Business Journal, Healthiest Employers, Healthiest 100, and the Houston Business Coalition on Health. So let's talk a little bit about uh, the program that we're evaluating. We call it the Wellness Discount Program, and we have some criteria and rules around it that employees need to uh, meet in order to get the discount. First and foremost, uh, the associate or employee uh, must complete an annual wellness exam, and if they're covering their spouse, the spouse does as well. And uh, it, th another thing that they have to do is they need to register for a transparency tool that we have in order to promote uh, consumerism in our health plan population. Uh, 
The preventive exams we monitor based on uh, data feeds from our health plan carrier and uh, the associate also has the ability to give us an explanation of benefit statement, uh, either from our health plan or if they're new to the company, they can show that from a health plan that they were on prior to coming to us. Uh, we allow someone to qualify for the wellness discount. Uh, we're in 2018 right now, so they could have gotten that wellness exam anytime in 2017, so in the prior year, but we give them a grace period all the way up to the end of March because we definitely want to make it easy and convenient for people to get that wellness exam completed. And by the way, the wellness exam could be a standard uh, routine well adult exam, or for women, it could be a well woman exam. The financial incentive that we offer is $900 per employee for the year, which is paid out on a pro rata basis uh, on each paycheck, and it's prorated for new hires and new entrants into the plan. Engagement is absolutely critical to the success of this program. First and foremost, to get participation, because obviously want, we want as many associates participating as possible. But also, we want to make them aware of the benefit of preventive care and how to get the most use of the preventive care visits that they have. Also, we see this program as feeding into our overall wellness culture, and so uh, uh, getting engagement in this program, we think, supports that overall program. Some of the things that we follow to get engagement is we keep the program simple to communicate, simple to qualify for, and we have simple messaging. We make sure that we have uh, touch points several times during the year. Uh, we really kick things off at annual enrollment in the fall to remind people with broadcast messaging, emails, all the benefits materials have this information. We send out individualized statements to associates' homes in December, letting them know if they have or have not qualified for the wellness discount and what step they may be missing so that they can be sure to take care of that. And then we send a second round of those statements uh, right about now in February to people who haven't qualified yet. We've taken some uh, additional steps with new hires uh, where we make we send similar statements to them and we make phone calls to them directly to be sure to engage them. And for the first time this year, we have a resource that's allowing us to make phone calls to people who have not yet gotten that wellness discount uh, to try to see if we can engage them in this program. All right, um, I'm gonna present a couple of the slides on participation. This first slide just shows participation in the discount program year over year since its inception. And as you can see, we've enjoyed a little bit of an increase over time, uh, but our participation is fairly steady around the 70th percentile range. Um, we, as I said, I think we get better and better in our engagement efforts. Uh, that seems to be maintaining more than gaining ground in this area. Uh, and this despite the fact that we've actually increased the wellness discount amount. We started off at $400, we raised it once to $640, and now we're up to $900. That being said, we think a 70% engagement rate is, is pretty good. A little bit of insight into who's participating and who's not. On the left, you'll see an age distribution. Uh, those who are participating in the wellness discount, those who are getting their annual wellness exam, are the blue bars. Those who are not are in the orange bars. And as you can see, uh, on the left-hand side, we do a little bit less well with our younger employee population, and we do better with our older population. I, I guess from my age, if I can say 40 to 45 is older, uh, but as we get into those ages, and uh, that's a good fact because we think that we probably have more impact in that area with preventive screenings. Then if we look at the chart on the right, again, uh, females are in blue, males are in orange. We see with the exception of 2013, women uh, are more compliant, more likely to be in this program than men. Uh, you see a little bit of a difference in 2013. Uh, the main difference I see there is in 2013, we did not require spouses to get the wellness exam. And since we have a heavily male uh, dominated population, didn't sound quite right. Uh, we have more men than women. Uh, 
that that is probably a reflection in increased spouse participation. Here we're looking at job level and participation in the wellness discount. And without going into too much detail, uh, what we tend to see is a correlation between the level in the company and participation in the discount, getting that preventive exam. Uh, executives are the most likely than managers, uh, a little bit less than professionals, and then our hourly population is uh, less likely than the other groups. Uh, we would think logically that maybe that 900 discount would have more of an impact perhaps at the lower end of the compensation scale, uh, so it might defy logic a little bit, but one of the insights into this hourly population is it does include our truck driving population, and uh, we know that those folks in particular are kind of hard to engage. So uh, that's part of the explanation there for not seeing quite as much participation there. All right, so um, let's look at a comparative al analysis focused on costs and medical conditions. Um, so here, this chart represents the average yearly cost of adult members whom we know have at least one chronic disease like diabetes or hypertension or heart disease. Um, so we're looking at how that average yearly cost per person varied through the five years since program inception and how that varied by the participation in the preventive care. So of course we know uh, that average health costs are rising in general year to year in most US populations. But what we can see here also in this trend is that in most part, the, the non-participating group was more costly on average. Uh, in, in some years, the variance is greater than others, like in 2015. And this can be attributed uh, often to a greater amount of outliers skewing those averages. <clears throat> Next, uh, if when we focus on the latest year, 2017, of the program and take a deeper look into some of the prevalent chronic conditions driving that average yearly cost, um, again here we see that on some like diabetes or heart disease um, or mental health, non-participants were somewhat more costly. Um, another thing to note here is when we look for conditions like obesity, nicotine dependency, uh, I, you know, the smokers, it's often more difficult to accurately identify those in administrative claims data. Um, and so the plan would have to be capturing that information through self-reported conditions like in a personal health assessment or an HRA. So, um, you know, otherwise, we, we often see lower than expected uh, prevalence rates in those categories. So essentially here, um, more indicative data on, on those types of conditions may clarify some of the ambiguity we're seeing in, in these numbers. Um, and then you know, understanding those that participate in the program versus those that don't was an important aspect for Friedkin's benefit team. So they can adjust health and wellness initiatives accordingly. Um, and when we looked at the prevalence of chronic disease through the population, we could see that participants have a higher prevalence rate of, of diabetes and cancer, uh, hypertension, and these diseases that we're looking at here, just to name a few. Um, however, we also suspect that those not participating may not be interacting actually at all with the health sy system, therefore flying under the radar as far as their identified conditions. Um, or they may simply be unaware that you know, they, they do have a condition or, or are at risk for a condition. So this leads us to the question, um, are those not participating uh, obtaining any medical care? aside from the preventive recommended by the program. And so, because if they are, then the reported rates of disease may be accurate. So that's what we take a look at next here. Um, and so this chart essentially shows the rate of non-participants who also aren't receiving any other type of medical care. Uh, and we call those silent members. Um, and so about 25% of them also did not seek any regular you know, doctor's office visit for an acute illness or anything like that. So the data here suggests that this trend is somewhat on the rise for non-participants. And literature tells us that an estimated 10 to 15% of silent members can become sick within 12 months. And then between 3 to 5% of those 
become high risk or high cost within two years. Uh, and that's due to you know, untreated conditions, uh, failure to get early intervention for serious health issues. You know, think of a cancer that's caught uh, too late or in, in later stages rather than one that's caught early. So ideally, we want most of the population to, at minimum, be seeking preventive care in order to uncover those health risks and conditions. Uh, and as a result, that's a win-win for the employer and the member because it allows for diseases to be identified at an earlier stage, uh, resulting in better outcomes and prognosis and all that, and, and obviously an impact on costs for the employer as well. Um, so this is an important phenomenon to track and metric to track uh, because it does shed light on what we may be missing just by looking at the administrative data that we have on the population. Um, so if we're going to get non-participants participating, we need to better understand that subset of the population. And building on the previous data points we already examined, here we analyze how silent members, how silent member rates fare across the three main job levels at Friedkin. Um, and here we break it down by, um, so essentially those are the non-participants that are also not receiving any medical care by the hourly workers, the professionals, and the managers. And note that here we did exclude executives because that group actually had a very high participation rate, so the denominator remaining is, is um, very small, so we did exclude it from this representation. Um, so what we see here is that participating workers uh, in the yellow bars had the highest rate of silent members, um, the hourly non-participating workers. And uh, with, really in most years, with exception to 2017, where um, the managers did, which is interesting. Um, and also the hourly workers, as Ted previously mentioned, do, do include, does include the Friedkin's trucking company workers who have a, a lower rate of health engagement across the board. So that trend is somewhat expected. Um, and you know, another interesting thing here is, you know, we suspect that workers' wages play a factor in health behavior, and in general literature does show that. Um, and trucking workers, however, have higher wages, as Ted mentioned earlier, so within this category, and yet we're still seeing a high rate of uh, non-participation here and, and, and non-engagement in the health system. So we know it's an area that could benefit from a deeper dive and perhaps a greater focus and, and outreach initiatives in addition to everything that's already being done, uh, just a, a more focus on, on that segment of the population. Um, so, okay, moving on to um, the cost perspective. So um, looking back at the average cost of treating an adult who exhibits some of these chronic conditions year over year for obesity, hypertension, heart disease, um, and one thing to remember here is that a lot of uh, individuals who have a chronic disease often have one or more other chronic diseases, and we call those comorbidities. Um, so this is representative kind of of an average cost uh, of those individuals that exhibit those diseases uh, at minimum. So for example, if we look at obesity uh, in 2017, the average cost of treating that was about $9,000 a year. And we can also see that across the board, the non-participating group lines are often a little higher uh, per year with some exceptions and some of the trend that we're seeing on, in some years. And then uh, somewhat of a converging trend between the two groups towards 2017. And although an annual preventive exam may not in and of itself reduce the cost of treating members with chronic conditions, uh, this type of data helps us compare how um, help, helps us compare how those who do have the chronic conditions utilize healthcare by their participation status. And part of the exercise a member naturally has to go through when they're um, trying to get their, those annual exams is to identify a primary care provider, you know, finally finding that family physician uh, in their area and taking, taking an appointment. And so determining that PCP relationship uh, we know is a key component in healthcare utilization and consumption. And so the hope is obviously that over time, that relationship translates to confidence in the, in the PCP, and, and so the member is encouraged to adhere to their 
uh, doctor's plan of care uh, and all the preventive recommendations like getting their cancer screenings and everything at the appropriate ages. So, And again here we, we continue to look at the representation of cost and just focus on some other diseases and we can see a lot of the similar trend that we saw in the previous slide. Uh, moving on to a broader representation of costs per adult member per year. Here we're examining the average yearly plan costs split by the participant status. Uh, and again, the focus is on adults because the children, you know, normally that would bring down the averages are excluded from this um, perspective. So we're not, not, not only um, focused on chronic disease as we did in the previous uh, look, uh, now we're looking at the higher level. And we can see that all participants' uh, average cost line was above, uh, the participants' cost line was above the non-participants. And uh, we know that the risk is higher in that group because of the prevalence of disease. So that's somewhat expected. And then on the right side, when we adjust those numbers by the risk score, we get a closer variance between the two cost lines. Um, and, and keep in mind here that um, we did factor in plan design into this analysis, and that's been relatively steady at Friedkin over the years, so it's not a determining factor uh, really as far as the cost uh, that we're looking at in this particular view. And on the pharmacy side, uh, we can see there, there is a higher uh, consumption and because of the higher risk and condition of that group, um, so that, that's what we're seeing on the pharmacy side as well. So uh, this is Ted. I, uh, we're shifting gears a little bit, and we're looking specifically at high-cost claimants in the plan and looking again at the two different groups, those participating in the wellness discount or getting their preventive care and those who are not. So the orange line represents those who are not. Uh, and what we see very clearly in this graph is that we have a higher percentage of high cost claimants in the non-participant group versus participant. We're defining a high cost claimant as any individual who hits $50,000 or more during a calendar year in medical and prescription drug claims. And the trend here is we see for our participant group a relatively flat line, uh, which is nice to see and in our non-participant group we see an increasing incidence of high cost claimants, again, the most sick and costly individuals in the plan. And by the time we get to 2017, we see about two and a half times as much incidence of high cost claimants versus uh, our participant group. Uh, we don't necessarily know why, but we can infer that perhaps getting that preventive care means we're catching things earlier and preventing uh, catastrophic events like stroke, heart attack, or maybe even catching some cancers earlier and treating them before they become more serious and costly to treat. The next uh, is looking at utilization uh, from three different perspectives, ER visits, inpatient days, and hospital admissions. And what we see here, again, comparing the blue line to the orange line, is uh, for ER visits, we definitely see fewer visits on the part of our participants versus non-participants. Again, uh, fewer hospital days, although that looks like it narrowed a little bit in 2017. Uh, as far as just hospital admissions, uh, it looks like a little bit more of a mixed bag in the earlier uh, part of this study. We see worse experience for our participants, uh, but then in more recent years, the experience is worse for non-participants. So we, we see this as very indicative that this uh, participant population uh, may be getting care and avoiding more catastrophic type of events, or maybe they're just, as in the case of ER visits, getting their care from a more efficient and effective source. And in fact, that's what this slide looks at. We're looking at the use of the emergency room for non-emergency reasons. So it could be strep throat or some other uh, non-emergency condition. And we see very consistently that our 
participants are much less likely to use the emergency room for non-emergent conditions. And as Serene had um, referenced previously, we think a, a very strong possibility behind this is that those who are getting their preventive care have a relationship with a primary care physician, so they're more likely uh, to see that primary care physician or another more efficient resource for their health care. So let's move on to examine uh, compliance with preventive care. Uh, and this is a, a broader uh, definition of preventive care in, that, uh, in, in terms of adherence to recommended screenings for age and gender appropriate um, individuals at, at levels in their life. So when we look at compliance rates here, we see once more that people who do participate are more compliant with things like their breast cancer and cervical cancer screenings, uh, adhering to medication to treat hypertension and so on. And so although there are no incentives tied to this type of preventive care per se, uh, we see that th those who are getting their annual visits being more compliant here. Um, and also, despite the cost trends that are not drastically different between the two groups, it's very likely, again, that the higher rates of compliance are driving um, the more favorable rates and the high cost um, chart that we looked at. Another way to look at compliance with preventive care or standards of care is through metrics focused on a chronic disease like diabetes, for example. So this shows us that even in diabetic par participants, that, that even the diabetic participants are somewhat better at, at adhering to standards of care, like um, getting their H HbA1c levels measured uh, at least once a year, receiving their neuropathic foot exams uh, done. And so, um, you know, those types of things are also indicative of the two populations and how their uh, health behaviors are different uh, across the board. Um, so. so in summary, just to wrap up and uh, kind of uh, go through some of the key findings that we've discussed, um, for one, we determined that there is an observed consistency in people's year-to-year -year participation status. Also, uh, we saw that women were more likely to participate than their male counterparts. Uh, of course, as expected, socioeconomic factors and particular job categories specific to Friedkin did impact participation rates. Uh, and some of the exceptions there, uh, as we mentioned, where some of the segments of the population, like the truck drivers, uh, that are difficult to, to engage despite a higher uh, compensation range. Uh, and then among chronically ill individuals, we saw that the average cost per year among non-participants is somewhat greater than that of, than that of their counterparts. Um, we also saw that non-participants non were more likely to utilize costly care like hospital uh, use, uh, ER use, in inpatient stays, and so on. And then uh, we also saw that non-participants have a higher rate of class outliers, um, and then their participants are more compliant with recommended uh, preventive care. So uh, as I said previously, engaging uh, our population and particularly our non-participants is a key priority for us. Uh, again, one of the things that we try to do is make sure that we're consistent in the way we communicate the program so we don't cause frustration in the population with a moving target or moving goal lines. Uh, we have a multi-touch point communication strategy make sure that all of our benefit materials contain information about the wellness discount and how to qualify. We send it to the home. We get that out by email. We send out um, uh, letters to the homes so that not only the associate is getting information about their program and if they've qualified, but the spouse has access to that information as well. As I had mentioned previously, we've started a new effort to have our on-site nurse and wellness coach 
uh, make proactive outreach to disengaged members. We're really doing that on a larger scale this year. So we'll find out what kind of impact it has, although we're seeing a secondary benefit there in getting more exposure to our coaching programs, which is a, a separate program from this that we do want to continue to build on. Uh, for new hires, When after about a year of running this program, we found that our new hires were among our lowest participating groups. So to address that, uh, we send a letter to the home right after someone enrolls in our medical plan to make sure they're aware of what they need to do to come to qualify for the discount. And then again, a month before the deadline to make sure that they know that the deadline is approaching. Our view is once somebody gets this discount, they're more likely to wanna to keep it because they don't wanna lose it. And that bears out in the patterns that we see. If someone's a participant, we see them remaining a participant. If they're a non-participant, they tend to stay in that category. So that new hire area is very important for the program. And uh, we try to be flexible. Uh, we we want to make sure people are getting their preventive care, but we don't tell them where they have to get it from. Uh, if someone is a new hire, we don't require that they get their preventive care on our plan. They can bring proof from another plan and a number of other factors to make sure that we're not allowing people to be excluded from this program for bureaucratic reasons. Great. So um, so the, the analytics we just looked at um, also encompasses um, a lot more at DHS. Um, we look at other ways and opportunities for population health improvement and cost savings. And so going forward, we'll be actually expanding the scope of that analytical framework by introducing uh, DHS's key health metrics dashboard, which also ties in lost work days into the platform in order to be able to measure trends in productivity amongst other uh, components. And ultimately, um, relying on integrated data to tweak and enhance programs is key to managing a health plan. Um, we need to understand the uh, often the very different pockets of members within a population, just like in this one, um, and how the benefit plan design and incentives can be optimized to maximize value to all members, and not just from a financial aspect, but certainly on the overall uh, health of the population. Um, so, I think we are ready for um, any questions um, that the um, attendees may have. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you both. Yes. Um, if you're out there in the audience, feel free to type in the questions on the, the GoToWebinar uh, application, and I can pass those on um, to both Ted and Serene. Um, let me give you one from the audience already. Um, uh, they had a question about, are you able to, at this point, measure anything like biometrics that would give you an indication that people, um, not necessarily participants versus non-participants, but looking at people who are enrolled over time and seeing any changes in, for example, A1C, any changes in weight or body mass index and so on, so that you can get a sense at what point you can start thinking um, we're going to start seeing a return, at least in health, if not in cost, right away. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. We have chosen not to do biometric screenings so far. Uh, we we certainly see some advantages, like you say, in being able to monitor health over time. Uh, we have done, in addition to the uh, analysis that's done here, uh, Serene and the DHS team have done some cohort analyses to look at health over time, uh, which I think it it somewhat mirrors what, what we've seen in the data presented today. Yeah, um, and, and that's certainly, you know, obviously the more data uh, components that we can pull together, uh, the more of a comprehensive view we have on a member's um, health status. So um, that those, those pieces can certainly be added in, you know, with time as uh, the program evolves and, and expands. Um, somebody else is asking, could you provide some tips on how you came to the discount amount that you're able to provide? I know that um, you already alluded to, it seems like at the, the different 
tiers, let's say. You have managers, you have um, hourly workers. Um, it would seem like $900 would be a little bit more of an incentive for some people than others. Um, can you just say a little bit about how you came to that amount? You know, we, like I said, we started at $400 and we ratcheted up to the $900 amounts. And when we were at the $400 amount, we got a little bit more feedback that maybe it wasn't uh, enough. And yeah, one of the, th one of the phenomena that, that we observe and hear about is people don't always look at that annual number. They look at what's showing up in their biweekly paycheck. And so now at $34 a paycheck uh, spread out over 26 pay periods, it seems to be enough. Uh, when we went from $600 to $900, we did not see a change in participation rates. So we don't really have a lot of reason to believe that taking that number up will get us any more participation. Um, just in terms of the mechanics behind the scenes, uh, this is a discount uh, off of the medical premium. It is the same amount no matter which plan you're enrolled in, the most expensive plan or the least expensive plan. It doesn't matter whether you're covering just yourself or your your spouse or your family. It's $900. Uh, it, it, we do that partly to keep it easy to understand, not, not complicated. Um, what we do is um, if someone, it, we, we look very carefully at how we subsidize our medical plan and what what we see is that when someone gets that $900 discount, we're subsidizing their participation in the plan uh, from you know, 83, 84% up to over 90%, which is certainly better than your average health plan subsidy, which is probably in the low 70 percentiles. But if you don't get that discount, your uh, subsidy is down as low as 40% or, or more like 50%, uh, maybe up to 60%. So uh, we do, uh, with that $900 amount, uh, we do keep a, create a little bit of cost neutrality to the plan with the people who aren't getting the discount or actually helping to pay for the people who do. Got it. Okay. Um, we're getting a few questions still about the, um, the longitudinal view. Um, and I, you know, one of the questions it refers to you're showing you're showing costs that look like they're a little bit higher for participants than non-participants. Um, I was I was struck by that as well, and it seems like a lot of the savings aren't going to be realized in the short term. Um, and in fact, perhaps some people who are actually um, using the system, they get a diagnosis of something that's a, a chronic illness. Um, they see the program uh, as it works for the participants and are joining then. Um, it, it seems like that would be one of the things that is showing costs that are a little bit higher. Um, so a, a, again, um, are you able to, or do you have any plans on looking one at uh, how costs for a person improve over time, but also is there any possibility of capturing some of these larger costs such as turnover? I didn't, uh... I didn't quite follow you on that last bit. Oh, so if, you know, when, when IBI thinks of costs, we have tended to think not just of healthcare costs, but we've yeah. thought of some of the other things that you've alluded to, um, absence, disability, and so on. One of the things, you know, and I'll, I'll, bring, I'll bring our group in for a little critique here. One of the things we have not really looked at is turnover costs, the cost of retraining somebody, the cost of new hires. Um, if for whatever reason you're not able to keep valuable people on the job, for example, they go into a long-term disability system, um, that's a cost that's not going to be captured in claims. And I just wondered if you've been able to look at once somebody participates or, or begins participating, what are the chances that you're going to keep them in the next year, the next two years, the next three years? I think well, is, that, that's a oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I think that I think the question kind of gets it. It gets at a little bit about organizational culture in a, in a, around the uh, you know around the horn way, and but it also gets at if the sickest people are going to stick with your company longer, given the great benefits, 
should you expect to see a little bit higher costs uh, among the people who are using the the uh, benefits? Well, there's a lot of good points in there. Uh, I think uh, first and foremost, the critique uh, that bringing in additional data such as uh, time missed from work, turnover, or other disability data would help give us a view as to the cost of illness that's not being captured here. Uh, whether we do see people remaining with the company uh, that are less healthy because of our better benefits, uh, that's, that's certainly a possibility. Uh, what, the way we see these benefits is we want to be competitive in the marketplace. We want to be an employer of choice, and we want to be able to, uh, to attract the best talent to the company. Uh, if in some cases that happens to be someone who is more ill, uh, and we have the resources to help that person and maybe help them not only uh, not only stay more healthy but control their own health costs and ours, uh, that could be an added benefit of the programs that we have in place. I, I think that that's a, in you know from our perspective that that's probably the the right approach because then at least that way you're folding in the the total cost. Let's not forget that people who are with a company longer are going to be accruing more experience and they're going to become more valuable to the company. Um, and just the, the way things work, they're also getting older and they're going to start having more kinds of conditions. So that's, it, that, that's a really it, great you know, it's an, Go ahead. It's an interesting point that you bring up because uh, retail, where we have uh, over 800 associates, typically has lean benefits and high turnover. Some of our retail units have very low turnover and are incredibly successful in the business that they are in. And we think a good part of that is due to the tenure of the organization there. But to your point, it, it has now become more of an aging workforce. And so we see the investment in making sure people get the preventive care, our health coaching programs, and some of our ancillary wellness programs will help mitigate that increase in cost while still maintaining a tenured and highly valued workforce. Um, we have a, a couple more questions. Um, I'm, I'm going to try and pull some of these threads together. Um, one would be if, if you could say a little bit about what is considered participation. I, I think you described a little bit what you consider participants versus non-participants, um, but also maybe a little bit about what you might see as um, barriers to participating. And so, for example, one of the examples was um, are you able to give people paid time off from work if they're hourly to participate in some of the programs, or does the does the uh, the program not really work in that way? Well, that's a that those are great questions. So as far as hourly associates uh, being able to take time off uh, to get their annual wellness exam, they can certainly use PTO or sick time or whatever happens to be available. Got it. Got it. Um, a little bit more about uh, the engagement issue. You have, you know, I, I, I take your point that over time you're you're getting seventy percent engagement, um, and then uh, I, I don't know if you're able to get more information from the from the non participants about, for example, if you've done any efforts to survey them and talk about why they aren't engaging. Yes, thank you. Uh, we have. Uh, we have conducted surveys of both participants and non-participants. And for the non-participant population, we find the most common uh, reason is that people don't have time. And so to your point, being able to take PTO is available, but for that group, that may not be seen as enough. And we have seen it, uh, and, and that same group said that it would be more convenient for them uh, if we were to provide on-site wellness exams, uh, which we have not yet done, 
but something that we have done for our truck driving population who are all required to get Department of Transportation physicals, uh, which we do not consider to be sufficient to meet the criteria for all the preventive care screenings. But what we have uh, contracted with our vendors who do TO, DOT physicals to at the very same time do the additional blood work for an annual physical. And so we have seen some increased uptake in getting preventive care in our truck driving population based on that. And, and we think that's important for a lot of reasons, but uh, we know our truck drivers have probably less free time than almost any other associate just because the amount of time they spend on the road. Got it, got it. Um, let me give uh, uh, one more question. And, and this is, I'm gonna ask you to think a, a little bit broadly about organizational culture in Friedkin. Um, you showed us that executives actually have higher participation rates um, than some of the other employee groups. Um, and I wonder if, if Friedkin has leveraged these executives and to kind of set the example for some of the other employers. We always hear about organizational culture starts at the top. And of course, a culture, uh, it implies that values are shared, beliefs are shared, expectations are shared. I wonder if the executives, um, if they play any role maybe in messaging, maybe in participating in events. Uh, we hear about organizational heroes a lot. I, I wonder if Friedkin has, uh, has just leveraged their own experience with the programs or if you have any plans to do so. Well, that's, that's a great point. So one of the things I did not mention is uh, we do a lot of communication in person Almost all of our business units gather their associates on a monthly basis, either for a sales rally or some type of other general business meeting for that business unit. So we will, on an annual basis, appear at those meetings alongside the business unit leader who will generally endorse the program, and then we'll get up and we will... Uh, kind of explain the details and, and make sure that people do understand the benefit. But uh, to your point, could more be done in that area? I, I think it could. I think it's a good uh, suggestion and probably something that we should look at. One of the areas that we do leverage within our organization is people can volunteer to be wellness champions. And while we don't leverage it uh, a whole lot on the wellness discount, and I can explain why in just a moment, uh, we do leverage it in other areas of health. And so when there's a wellness message going out to our associate population, whether it's in person or in writing, uh, it's, it's not only coming from the benefits department or HR, but it could be per someone working in the cube next to you who's just one of your peers. And we think that the messaging will reach more ears and be more effective if we do kind of a peer-to-peer -peer. One of the tricky things that we have with the wellness discount, and it doesn't, it's not necessarily a counter to anything that you're suggesting, is our legal has advised us that participating in the wellness discount, having gotten your wellness exam, is considered PHI. So we actually discourage our executives and managers and so forth from inquiring with associates about their personal health information. So we have to walk a fine line in that area. But to your point, I think uh, that it's probably something that we could leverage more and we, we certainly could get reinforcement and we may see some more participation as a result. Very good, very good. Any, any last suggestions um, for anybody who is going to start taking this uh, approach, the incentivized approach? Um, any pitfalls they might want to avoid? You get you just gave us a very good practical one concerning PHI. Um, last thoughts? Well, you know, one of the things that um, I did not anticipate personally when we rolled this out was it, it takes a bit of effort. Uh, it takes effort to track. 
Uh, it took time to get up the get the data feeds working correctly and accurately. Uh, it takes a lot of effort to do the engagement programs, uh, to create the reminder statements and so forth. So I've built a little cottage industry within my department to make this work smoothly and accurately. And I definitely think that it's worth the effort, but just make sure that you have the resources to do that. I, uh, I have not found a vendor to run this program for me. Uh, but the, the one thing I will say is that if you want to know what value you're getting out of this program, partnering with a data analytics company is really the only way I've found out how to do it. My uh, PBM and carrier are not able to distinguish between my participant and my non-participant population. They're not able to drill down within my different companies. And this is information that I need in order to be able to make decisions about the program. So uh, I, I will make a plug for our partners in this, for DHS or any other company that's able to provide that type of analytics to know what is actually the result of what you're doing. Very good. And, and uh, you know, I'll just say that um, as you're developing your cottage industry, um, I, I think all of us who've been on this webinar have been the beneficiaries of your experience. So thank you very much to Serene Jazzy and Ted Barrell for participating and telling us a little bit about the Friedkin Group. And thank you all for listening in on the webinar. Um, I really appreciate it, and I hope to see all of you at IBI's forum, March 12th to 14th in San Francisco. Ted and Serene, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.